Good evening. Um, thank you, Vanina. Media archaeological aesthetics, in my point of view, is ice cold indeed. I am at the same time a passionate media archaeologist, and I am especially excited that Catalonia is now interested in media archaeology. So thank you for um, doing this evening and doing um, this event. I will present you my version of what I call radical media archaeology. Media archaeology, as we heard, is both, or maybe you say it's not, but anyway, media archaeology is both a method and an aesthetics of approaching technological objects. Radical media archaeology, with its closeness to Foucault's archaeology, and with its tendency to adopt the non-human, media-active view, differs from soft archaeological metaphors. One characteristic of media archaeology is its focus on technical materialism, as you said, analytically or creatively bound to practices like circuit bending, while a more rigorous challenge is the techno-mathematical investigation of code and algorithms as the essence of computing. This is the object media archaeology has to face. This is the contemporary challenge for media archaeology. To counterbalance speculative events like the excavation of once buried computer game cartridges cartridges, like the famous ET computer game, which is the logo for this evening. Thank you for putting it on. Um, to counterbalance this nostalgic archaeological idea of what is media archaeology, a more code-oriented critical resistance to the archaeological metaphor becomes almost obligatory. It is tempting for me now to connect here directly to Thomas Elderser's talk, thank you for that, and his recent book, which is called Film History as Media Archaeology. And I would just touch, a, in, include an intermezzo on cinematography, because in my media archaeological reading, Cinematography is not just an intermedium, uh, intermediary medium which is lost now in digital times. On the contrary, cinematography, the cinematographic apparatus, anticipated the digital image because chronophotography and the moving photographic image, they have stilled time and now return within the Turing machine, within the computer, where its operational tape for reading and writing characters is the digital equivalent of the moving still. Now this is a, a drastic thesis which I now here proclaim. The photographic stepwise film frame recording and projection has already prefigured what is contemporary sampling of analog signals into digital data. While the framed image itself in current computing not only implodes into the pixels of the digital image, like micro frames, but even disappears into algorithmic moving image compression. Digital moving images, therefore, and computation as such, even if it is sound, is both the apothesis and the post-histoire of the cinematographic mechanism. Because cinematography is mechanistic, mechanistic, stilling time, arresting time, time discrete, it is much closer to the essence of what the computer does because the computer can only compute step by step, one bit at a time. That makes it so close structurally to the good cinematographic apparatus, much closer than the electronic image 
or acoustic waves. So that's about the presence, the radical presence of cinematography as a mechanism within computing. Bracketed by mechanically discrete cinematography and the nowadays computational discrete image, in between there is or there has been the epoch of the analog electronic image. Recently, algorithms themselves have become the media active archaeologists of archaic video recordings. And for the challenge of media cultural heritage, digital video art preservation becomes a case study in applied media archaeology. What I say is to save the heritage of the electronic image to the future, it is being digitized and the closest reader of video art and other video is the digital computer itself. The media archaeologist is not only humans like me and Thomas and others. The most important media archaeologists are media technologies which look at other medias, which nowadays is the computer by sampling. The media archaeological method is rather about representing to take a term by Vivian Zobczak, representing, making present something, then historicizing. I have to say a term like historical <coughs> media archaeology, which has been used by Friedrich Kittler and by Thomas Elsesser, in my view is an oxymoron. If you are a brilliant historian, you don't need the word media archaeology for that. It's a good, good way of doing historical research. Media archaeology is about something which historical discourse misses. Media archaeology as a method of technological research stays close to the signal. That is the event which counts, the signal itself, be it analog waveforms or digital pulses. And that even has consequences for the way of writing. What I call diagrammatic media archaeography, to set it apart from writing history of technology. This diagrammatic media archaeography experiments with alternatives to cultural familiar, familiar narrative forms of media historiography. Even nonlinear history is still historiography. Media archaeography, archaeography tries to develop a different way of writing the media in, the in a transient way, not writing about media in the past, but writing the media in terms of grammar. This is a different aesthetics. That leads to technical miniature, miniatures which are the core modules of media archaeographical writing. A way of close reading, to borrow this term from literary studies, or thick description, to borrow this from ethnography, of technical details as new kinds of sources about the past. To mention a colleague, Nick Montfort, a, a leading scholar in computer gaming. Nick Monkfort's website, which is called Trope Tanks, assembles such a series of what he calls technical reports. Now, we don't leave that only to the engineers or to the computational people. Technical reports should be a skill for people of humanities and for artists to write, which is of course a challenge and I have to admit I'm still trying to achieve it myself. For media archaeological analysis, the notion of archaeological or even geological layers, time layers, stratigraphy, is metaphorical and even misleading. Please don't confuse media archaeology with archaeological digging out the past. 
And I briefly mentioned that most people forget that when Foucault defines what he means by archaeology and the archive in his book, Archaeology of Knowledge, he writes it, please read it in French. He's, he writes l'archive in the singular, while the state archive, the memory institution in French, is always les archives. He is closer to Immanuel Kant, to the idea is of what is the governing law, the principle which makes possible textual, optical, or ac acoustic enunciations. And in a similar way, media archaeology looks at the basic principles which are driving technology. So it's not about digging out old things. The iPhone, as we know, or other smart devices, every microprocessor in embedded computing nowadays is so flat that there is no layer. The metaphor fails. Uh, the electric circuitry, the programming, demands a different non-metaphorical archaeology. It demands an archaeology which of technology in a double sense. What is technology? It's techne and logos. That's what the word says. Techne reminds of the electrical or physical hardware because media are always have to take place in hardware, whatever virtual or immaterial they seem. But then there is Logos, which is new about the computer compared to all other previous media. Mathematics, logics, this is the driving mechanism of the computer. This is radically different and breaks with all the media of the early 20th, 19th, 18th, 17th century. So the computer itself introduces the, the archaeological rupture, the break, which uh, Thomas mentioned. And it would be misleading to try to find prefigurations in former media. A geological notion of deep time of the media, as it has been expressed by Siegfried Zelinsky, or even more radically by Jussi Parika, both brilliant media archaeologists, but Jussi Parika goes even down to mineral excavations, enriching media archaeology with ecological concerns. Now we are even in geology. But once more, I repeat this. The archaeological metaphor prevails but is misleading when it comes to expressions like a media excavation into raw material basis of technological developments. Media archaeology is analysis. It's analysis and not digging out. So I dare to say it in alliance with Michel Foucault let us not use the words in the common way. Let us redefine them. Now, what I propose to you this evening is what I call radical media archaeology. This term takes its departure from technology itself. It concentrates on the epistemological insights because the more technical I try to talk, the more philosophical I want to think about it. This is the, the, maybe the unique combination of media archaeology, to think philosophically about technological details. And that is why media archaeological insight can only be derived from close analysis of electromechanical artifacts, electronics, and finally computational machines. Literally, Media archaeology takes the arche, we have not a drawing board here, but what is the central part of the term archaeology, the arche? Now, uh, arche is not only the beginning in historical terms, but as Derrida reminds, the command. And I take, when I say 
radical media archaeology, the RK in its mathematical sense, the algorithmic routing in numbers. And that's why the, the logo, the trademark of radical media archaeology is the square root symbol. I want, that is my alternative to the archaeological metaphor of digging out things, to think mathematically about the most important medium of today, which is computing, to go to its mathematical roots. But these roots are mathematical and not, and not historical and not archaeological in the traditional sense. And even the traditional academic science of archaeology, classical archaeology, for example, is not concerned exclusively with the material artifact unburied from the ground anymore. Even archaeology now, in this science, a radical mathematization has taken place. Archaeology, the traditional tra uh, discipline of archaeology has been among the first humanities disciplines to apply the computer. Because archaeology is a non-narrative science. It has to do with big data which are not organized by accompanying texts, clusters of data. For on which we have to calculate probabilities. So here, so-called digital humanities or computational philology becomes a twin method of media archaeology. I mentioned another twin discipline to media archaeology, which is digital forensics. Forensics trains closest analysis of technological traces and digital forensics uh, has been developed to find traces in our computers. They have the most precise way of looking at data even when they seem to be erased and forgotten and effaced. They will always find a rest magnetism from which to reconstruct evidence. So we can learn from digital uh, forensics to uh, look at technology and Matthew Kirschenbaum in the USA, actually a literary scholar in his book Mechanism, has developed a media archaeology in terms of digital and computational forensics. But I can even quote a sociologist to make a bridge to science and technology studies, Gabriel Tard in 19th century. He has been rediscovered as a leading theorist of how to do sociology. But I quote, he, it was interesting enough, Tart, who says he appreciates two sciences the most, which is the archaeologists and the statisticians. The statisticians who calculate sociology in numbers. He puts that close to the archaeologist who calculates dispersed data. And now I can say, quote in French, the statistician and the archaeologist jette sur les faits humains un regard tout abstrait et impersonnel, which is a non-human perspective on human culture. Now that what I call cold, this is but I take the non-human as a, a necessary first step to look in a different way at human artifacts. Then we arrive with all the love of human culture at other perspectives. Walter Benjamin, as we know in 1936, still compared the cameraman to the surgeon. That's already cold enough, distant enough, just as Michel Foucault focused on the clinical gaze. Actually, I want to mention, but this is not the subject of my talk, that media archaeologists have ears as well. There is an acoustic archaeology, because I am very critical 
that 90% of media archaeological talk is all about images. It's important for our visual perception, we know that, uh, but we have ears as well, and they are our time organs. The ear can listen to evidence uh, for which a, an acoustic media archaeology and the media archaeology of the acoustics can be uh, quite enlightening. But to come back to the gaze, in its radicalized operation, the media archaeological gaze converges with technological imaging itself. Imaging is the term for technologies which produce images. They don't reproduce images, they produce images. Like an optical scanner recognizes the material artifact. And the so-called imager, as you know, is the device for deciphering QR codes. In our, we, we have it in our pockets, devices which look at things in a media archaeological way. We use it. Now, why shouldn't we become more aware of it? Media archaeology refers to both aspects, as I mentioned already, the physical artifact on the one hand, the Greek techne, and its mathematical analysis, the logos, when it comes to computa computational devices. And only this makes the composite term technology. So I'm talking about technological things, not simply technical things. And I'm talking about electronics and not about electrics. This is, uh, makes all the difference for what we call media culture. Otherwise, it would be enough to say we are talking about cultural techniques. But media culture is an escalation. The application of techno-mathematical tools of analysis to archaeology results in media-active archaeology. I already mentioned that as well, uh, that media themselves can look at other media in an analytic way. Now, I briefly mentioned the uh, computer archaeology of the ET computer game. Media archaeology is not just a theory, although it's hard enough to be a theory, but a research method as well. Therefore, its character is object-orientated and operational. Media archaeology is always linked to the real media thing. That makes a difference from maybe textual studies. What separates computer archaeology from previous technologies is its double focus on both hard and software. Because it's easy to talk about old media. They are simply good old hardware technology. They are mechanical, maybe they are electronic, but the challenge is the new medium called computer, which is now half a century old, which requires both material and logical approach. The obsolescence of past computer devices cannot be reduced to the naive understanding of digging out its residual materialities as has been suggested by the spectacular digging of the Atari computer game cartridges, cartridges a few years ago. And I think I have a little, um, yes, you see the antique computer game ET the extraterrestrial, one of the earliest computer games from 1982, has become the target of a soft and hard way of practicing media archaeology. And ironically, the soft version concerns hardware and the hard version concerns software. Let us remember, the economic failure of the computer game ET the extraterrestrial in the early 1980s, because it didn't work. If you played it, it didn't work. The, the, the effort to, to, to produce uh, sort of virtual reality effects in the, those days of computers because of a co co software coding error failed. So this collapsed, nobody bought it. And that resulted in, the f in a major crisis of computer game industry and led to the literal dumping of both 
the hardware, the computer consoles, and um, the cartridges in the desert of New Mexico. It was buried, it was damped, until it has been archaeologically, now literally, rediscovered in 2014. And that's how it looks. Quite spectacular. But different from the classical cultural museum object, technologies and such technological devices are in a medium state only when processing signals. And that requires a new form of processual media archaeology. It's not enough to dig out a computer cartridge and put it in a museum. Then it has nothing to do with medium. It's a piece of plastic. A me the, the term medium only makes sense if processually an artifact is processing signals or data. Otherwise, a radio which is switched off is not in a medium state. So medium is, the term is processual. That makes it such a challenge for, it's not enough to dig it out. You have to, make, to reprocess it. And that's why I say the real excavation of computational devices of past times is going to the roots of the programming code within such cartridges, which requires disassembling, because they were written in assembly language at that time. That requires disassembling the source code in a radical techno-mathematical media archaeology. And I uh, quickly show you how that looks. The Aperture Labs open microchips or and here you look and you look at a ROM it's a grid that's where the bits bit by bit can be identified and you can read out from the magnetic latency which bits were zero and which are one and by disassembly you reconstruct the code in which it was written now, this is real and radical media archaeology, not the images which went through, in which you can look at YouTube with their archaeologists digging out cartridges. That is just the first step. I skip the part on circuit bending and continue. media themselves as archaeologists. Media archaeology aims at an archaic media experience. Once again, archaic is not meant in the historical or historicist sense, but in the terms of bringing out the principles, reducing it, rarifying it. It's not a simplification, but a conscious analytical reduction to technological essentials and principles. Media archaeology therefore looks at the moments of technological emergency, not in terms of historicism. Of course, we look at the beginning of media, at the invention of media, but not for historicist reason. But because technological structures become evident in their beginnings, I quote Lance Siefking, who wrote one of the first television dramas transmitted by the BBC in London in the 1930s. He once said, it is in the beginning of invented things, which appeal to me, for it is in the beginnings that we may detect their true nature, which is their epistemological essentials. Now, I took this quote from a book from the memoirs of John Logie Baird, who was one of the co-inventors of electromagnetic television. And these memoirs of John Logie Baird, they provide an archaeological insight into the first steps of the television apparatus. The way how the, how the memoirs of John Logie Baird describe 
his invention of television gives you a brilliant introduction into the basic principles of a very complicated electronic medium called electronic television. So read it, not, not for historical reasons, not for nostalgic reasons. Read it to get an introduction on the base, how basically television functions. And then from that you learn what makes it so different from the pixel image. For most media is true that what developed into mass media later, like the television, has originally been developed for analysis as measuring or storage devices in experimental research, which is true for the Edison phonograph, which was preceded by Scott's phonautograph to register the frequencies of the human voice for analytic purposes because it before it was reversed into synthesis by replay. Or the cinematograph, as we all know, was preceded by chronophotography, which is, uh, was again a measuring medium, not a projection medium. Radio, one of the major mass media of 20th century, always is quoted for having been invented by Heinrich Hertz Karlsruhe experimental verification of uh, sending sparks and resonance. But this was done not for inventing radio, but for proving that electromagnetic waves equal light waves, which is true. So most media have been invented, and we can be proud to say, at universities for analytical reasons, for scientific reasons. And the television tube was developed out of a measuring device, Ferdinand Braun's electronic oscilloscope. The oscilloscope itself, such as the famous TV tube, which now only metaphorically survives under the name of U-tube, is a subclass of the thermionic tube, which functionally endures in transistors and highly integrated circuits within microprocessors and appeared in the media theatrical scene even before humans could appre apprehend it. Thomas Alva Edison, when experimenting with an improvement of his light bulb, incidentally came across what became known as the Edison effect, which the inventor got pat patented without being even knowing what was going on. He could not explain this effect, Edison, but he got it patented, which was in fact the thermionic tube as a diode emanating in a glimmering shadow on the inner glass surface, which was a kind of first appearance of what we later call television image. So the, the medium was more clever than the humans which experimented with the medium. Media archaeology would, like object-oriented ontology, say there is an, an implicit knowledge of media which waits to be discovered by humans. It's, we turn this upside down. And since media archaeology is about real media, I brought with you a, a thermionic tube. And I have to touch such a medium device while I talk. Because when I, when I project, it's just a digital image. This is a real medium, and this is one of the core media uh, of, of media culture. And I brought a twin, which looks exactly the same, but this is just a metaphorical uh, USB memory stick, which looks like a thermion tube. But then we can turn it upside down and say, okay, the, the double-crossed circuited thermionic tube has been the first flip-flop which was the first storable bit. So the metaphor here is return, the bits which are stored inside this USB stick metaphorically tells the truth about how the bit came into existence by the thermionic tube. The same thermionic tube which resulted in television, the same thermionic tube which resulted in microwave heating. Now, this is a fascinating, it doesn't look like something for which uh, human imagination can say a lot, but this is a true 
uh, uh, object of media archaeological studies. It's one of the secret driving engines of what is media culture. And we trace it back to the first archaic moment when Edison discovered it without knowing what it actually is. So, between the phenomenological surface of media, which we mostly experience, the human-oriented side of media, and their concealed or secret RK opens a dramatic gap. And media archaeology does not try to smoothen this gap. We are already enough phenomenological when we use media, but it's interesting to discover media in a non-phenomenological way. Technological media are non-discursive formations, which can rather be addressed in techno-mathematical terms. Media archaeology performs a micro-epistemology, that is, discovering, analyzing, and describing the knowledge sparks which spring from the most concrete level of technology itself, such as the delicate electronic sawtooth signal generator, which creates the jumps of single cathode ray lines within a television set in order to create the impression of an electronic image. Most people know television from what it looks like. Very few people ask or are aware and go back to all early Greek philosophical wondering. What a wonder is it that a television image happens, is successful, and not just a distorted, noisy, unrecognizable electronic articulation. The more I looked, I mean, this is one of the media I had to learn because I was not trained as an engineer. And suddenly I became a professor of media theories. I had to learn what are media. Now, I was fascinated by television, one of the most complicated media in terms of electronic, in terms of synchronizing signals between sender and receiver, breaking the single lines, having interlaced half images, and how it internally happens between condensers and high voltages and uh, re delay lines for color television. Such a fascinating cosmos of what which unfolds if you open the television and don't not just look at it on the tube. And then the more I see it, the more I modestly start to philosophically wonder how it happens. And then we discover a beauty of cultural knowledge. This is an achievement that we can transmit television images. And when we look at an early television, television like uh, this uh, American RCR 630TS, this was one of the first post-war uh, American television mass sold uh, television set. Please always be aware, because in most lectures you see something like this even in many books on media archaeology. This, is the, this photograph lacks the essential medium definition. This is not signal processing. The tube is empty. And that's why the museums have a big problem. Most technological museums or cultural museums show a medium like this. This is not a medium. And that is why we have assembled in our university our own collection of media because we are allowed to re-operate an old television so that students and myself can see what does, does, does a black and white image on an early television look like. Then you are close to the medium, not in this um, kind of display. I probably have not many more minutes. So uh, I quickly have to come to the point that John Logie Baird, whom I mentioned as one of the inventors of early television, he, uh, well, what happened? In the BBC archives, gramophone records were discovered. You put them on a player and it produces only noise. So what is it? And it turned out it's not about sound recording, but it, is one of, it was the earliest television recording, 30-line television, line by line, on a shellac record. 
John Logie Baird called his invention, which was, a which was video before electronic video, he called this phonovision because he recorded the television image, which we think is visual, on an acoustic recording device. And I quickly give you an impression how that looks and please listen. see that actually online if you want, suddenly a human face appears out of this gramophone record recording and um, you, you could hear why it was recorded on gramophone because at that time the frequency of the television signal was in the audible range. So you put a loudspeaker to the electronics and you can hear it and the inventor said he could even tell the kind of image by listening, he had an earphone on and he said he developed a skill to tell what the image was like by listening to its acoustics. This is amazing, but this is not the last word on this because if you have this on a gramophone record, you might try to play it, but you don't see an image. Now it required Donald McLean, who wrote a book called Restoring Baird's Image, nice title, where where especially he's a specialist on digital computer graphics. He managed to apply the right filters to do the necessary signal corrections, which were then algorithmically able to reproduce these earliest recordings of human beings by television. So it was only by computational algorithms that we could get very media archaeologically to the first recordings of television images. It's not the human, it is the computer who saw those first images again. Now this has, I think, drastic consequences for our idea of cultural heritage. The future historian will not necessarily be human. It will be something um, uh, like colleagues called it, the robot historian or the computational historian, because for in order to see technical media again, we need more advanced technical media. This is non-human and fascinating in the most human sense at the same time. And I think for reasons of time, I might end with this message and not further discuss questions of video preservation to the future. And maybe just make one more point, maybe some museum people are here as well. It's absolutely necessary not to keep the hardware devices in museums, which is very important, and the video players, but to keep them operational. Like with all early computer games, which I mentioned, it was not academics, it was not the professional engineers, it was the computer gamer community amateurs, young people themselves, who developed the principle of emulation, which is maybe the big future of what will become the memory of our media age. Because we all know computer programs, web pages, they disappear very soon. By emulation, you can, with your actual computer, be in the state of playing a computer, Commodore 64 or others, of the early 1980s. So a computer can be its own predecessor. And it's not a simulation, it's an emulation. When I play an old computer game with an emulator on my computer now, my computer is in the state of the old computer. 
It's not simulating the old one, not reenacting. It is the one. That's why it's called emulation and not simulation. Now, now this is a fascinating new epistemologic term. Practically, it exists. That's the secret for transmitting computational memory to the future. And it's our task as people from academia to bring out the philosophical, epistemological meaning of a term like emulation and their concepts and how proudly we can say that early 21st century has enriched culture by something which we cannot trace back to the Greeks or the Renaissance, but this is a product of our media time itself, but it has a philosophical dimension and with this very emphatic terms, uh, I end and not with a technical detail. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>